Good morning. Welcome to worship at Fountain of Life. Our theme for worship uh, today in this season of Lent is our theme throughout Lent that we're rethinking different parts of our faith. And today specifically, we rethink the worth of worship. That primarily we gather for worship and receive from God, receive his forgiveness and his love. Secondarily, then, we respond to him out of praise. We begin that praise with hymn 912, Open Lovely Doors. This is a new hymn in the hymnal, but it is a tune that is probably familiar to some from the red hymnal. So we'll open with that hymn, Open Lovely Doors, that you can find in the blue hymnal in front of you, and will also be projected on. Once again, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. I have a bad habit of assuming the worst. Leads me to worry about all kinds of things I don't need to be worrying about. But it also affects the way that I think about sharing the gospel with someone. Sometimes I assume that they're going to reject the message, that they'll think I'm weird or crazy. Sometimes I assume that they've heard it all before and have some reason for ignoring it that they'll just throw back at me and and walk away. Now, if that's ever been you, it's not like we have no reason to maybe assume some of those things. We live in the world. We know people. Maybe you're on social media. Maybe you watch the news. We hear that the world is trending, or our culture at least, more anti-Christian. It's more acceptable to be as into religion as you want or as opposed to religion as you want. Our culture generally pushes people away from church rather than towards it. Jews demand signs. Greeks look for wisdom. That's what Paul said. And our world isn't too different from then. Our world demands signs. Our world demands hard proof according to their own rules. God has been completely removed from the science conversation. And if they wanted to find God, they would only like to find him within their own boundaries they've set up. Really, if you're going to talk about God, you're outside the conversation of most of the intelligent people in our world. The world looks for wisdom. The world looks for advice on how to live or how to look at life from the successful, from the influencers, from the entertainers and the experts. People look to different philosophies, different habits to build. Maybe people look for certain communities that might think the same way and maybe look down on others who think differently. Maybe religion is a part of this conversation if you really want it to be, but only if you want it to be, and then it's good for you. If religion helps you, that's fine. 
How do we react to this culture, to this world that we live in? With this message that we have of the cross. Do we hold back from sharing it? Are we tempted to water it down to make it easier for someone to swallow? How do we look at this world that wants signs and wisdom? Do we try to appeal to that and try to win the argument for Jesus? How do we satisfy our own desire for signs and wisdom? Because we are in this world too. We are tempted to mix our faith with the word of God and this certain philosophy or successful person that I heard give some good advice. We are tempted to mix our faith with the word of God and what the intelligent people of the world think. We are in a world that looks down on the cross. That can't see anything good in suffering, let alone the suffering of a man 2,000 years ago. Paul and the Corinthians lived in a world that looked down on the cross. Paul was writing to the Corinthians in chapter 1 to encourage them Not to have divisions in their church, because that's what they were doing. They were following this trend of the world to look to an influential person and make that their identity. And so there were divisions forming in their church that didn't need to be there. Paul wanted to show them what the way of thinking of the world really was and where it led. And the thinking of the Jewish world at that time, Jews demand signs. They look for proof according to their rules. Now, they weren't so much looking for a solution to sin and guilt. They thought they already had that. They had God's holy law, the Ten Commandments that we read from Exodus earlier. Some of them thought that they kept it well enough to earn salvation before God, Others thought that they could be saved based on their race. They're they're Jews. They're the chosen Old Testament people of God. So they, they were still looking for a savior, but not a spiritual savior. A physical savior. They wanted a a political leader or a military leader to free their nation so they could live easier and more free lives. What did they see in the cross? Weakness. The Savior isn't supposed to come and die. He's supposed to be our our great leader for our nation. He's supposed to at least set up some kind of lasting kingdom first before he dies. That's what they wanted from Jesus. They heard the message of Jesus on the cross and thought, the Christ is supposed to come and have favor with God. This person was put to death in the most shameful way possible, crucifixion. He was abandoned by God. He was weak. Paul also talked about the way of thinking of the Greeks at that time. Greeks look for wisdom. They look for something that appeals to their human reason. Not so much looking for a solution to sin and guilt. They thought they already had that too. The Greeks were famous for their different philosophies that they made popular, and these philosophies had something to say about sin and guilt. Some say, ignore it. Just avoid suffering at all costs to do whatever you want to that makes you happy. Others look at sin and guilt and say, that's society's fault. It's only because you're put under pressure by by this society. You should avoid society altogether. Still others 
say you choose your emotions. So choose not to feel that. The philosopher Aristotle would say that you, you do have an obligation to serve your fellow human being. So do it. Improve as a human being. Those are the kinds of answers the world comes up with. Jews demand signs, and Greeks look for wisdom. What did the Greeks see in the cross? It's too simple. It's too straightforward. Jesus did it all for me already. It's, it's too easy. There's nothing to work out or, or reason out. What did they see in Jesus on the cross? Foolishness. You say that the Son of God died? God, God can't die. You say that Jesus' perfection counts for me? That's not how this works. I can't get spiritual credit for the good that somebody else does. I have to do it myself. What did the Greeks see in the cross? Something as offensive to their self-esteem, too. You say that, that my sin is bad enough that it makes me deserving of eternal punishment? You say that the good that I do counts for nothing before God when it comes to salvation? That's pretty dismissive. But where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Where did all this wisdom and reason and looking for signs and searching for power get all of these people? Where does it lead people today who look to the successful and the influential and the science? At best, maybe a sense of purpose, some good advice in one area of life. At best, maybe a helpful way of thinking about this certain situation that you're facing. But big picture, where do all these ways of thinking according to the world lead? Not eternal salvation. The world can't promise that. It can't provide that comfort. It can provide some maybe hopeful quotes and phrases, but they're empty. There's nothing behind them, nothing to back it up. Ultimately, outside of Christ, everything, everyone leads to death. The world looks to fallible human beings, error-filled reason, outward shows of power, strength in numbers of human beings. But where do we find real power, real wisdom? That is in Christ crucified. We look to the word of God. And we believe what it says there, and that is what we share with other people. That we preach Christ crucified. Because our God was pleased to save through the foolishness of what was preached. God was pleased to save sinners through the gospel. That God so loved the world. That he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. That is the wisdom of God. That we needed a Savior and God gave him to us. And we did need a Savior. Our sin is that serious that it makes us deserving of hell. It's not enough to ignore it. It's not enough to improve. And so God gave us what we needed. Jesus Christ. And Jesus went to the cross to take the punishment for all of our sins and guilt. There is your solution. Jesus died on the cross to save you. Full forgiveness, free salvation, a complete gift from God. It had to be that way. That is the wisdom of God. That he saw us who needed a savior and gave him to us. 
in the cross of Jesus, we see God's power displayed. That's where God, in his wisdom, chose to display his power on the cross. A way better display than any earthly kingdom that could be set up. God chooses to spread his spiritual kingdom through the message of Jesus on the cross for us. That we are saved through Jesus. And so, God grows his kingdom in the hearts of believers. Jesus did give a sign. It's not the sign that the Jews wanted. Not the sign that the world looks for. In John, we heard Jesus say, destroy this temple and I will rebuild it in three days. The temple he was speaking of was his body. That Jesus was killed and was raised to life after three days. This must be the Son of God. What better sign could you ask for a man dying and being brought back to life? He must have the power to save. And the Corinthians that were in that church that Paul was writing to were Jews and Greeks who now saw that Christ crucified is the power of God and the wisdom of God. They saw Christ crucified as the one way to salvation. They were the people who were thinking in all these ways according to the world, but who now realized that Christ crucified is the power of God and the wisdom of God. They were brought together in Jesus, and so Paul urges them, don't separate yourselves based on human ways of doing things, separating yourselves according to different leaders that you want to follow. No, join together under Christ crucified, Jesus on the cross for you. What does all this mean for us? Us who still live in a world that opposes Jesus in so many different ways? Well, for one, it encourages us not to see weakness where the world tempts us to see weakness. Because Jesus looked weak on the cross. He, he was weak. He, he died. But on the cross is also where Jesus fully displayed his power, where he conquered the sin of the world, where he conquered the prince of the world, the devil. On the cross is where Jesus won the salvation that took us who were spiritually dead and made us spiritually alive. On the cross is where Jesus earned the salvation that was able to take an enemy of God and turn her into a daughter of the Most High. Paul's letter to the Corinthians, this section, also encourages us not to lean too heavily on our reason especially in spiritual things. It's really okay that the way God saves may bend our concept of a God who cannot die. It's really okay that the way God saves may bend our concept of what is justice. Because this is how God chose to save in his divine wisdom, that somehow the Son of God would die. That somehow his perfection would count for you. And so you are saved. We preach Christ crucified. Let the world call it what they want. Foolish, stupid, weak, outdated. We know that it is the power of God and the wisdom of God. We love and believe in the cross of Jesus, despite any opposition we've heard to it. The Holy Spirit has been able to work in our hearts to keep us in faith, despite anything opposed to the cross that we've heard. The Holy Spirit has even worked through the gospel to even strengthen our faith. So maybe we should give the Holy Spirit a little bit more credit. Maybe I should give the Holy Spirit a little more credit when I think about sharing that message to other people, too. 
Because this is how God is pleased to save, through that message of the gospel. This is the power of God and the wisdom of God. And of course, even God's so-called weakness is stronger than human strength. His so-called foolishness is wiser than human wisdom. And so we are content with this. We preach Christ crucified. Amen. Please stand.